Today's podcast was recorded yesterday. If you want to listen to my podcasts commercial-free the day that I record them, go to shiftradio.com slash premium. It only costs $5 a month. Today's podcast is sponsored by Shopify. Shopify is a platform designed for anyone to sell anywhere, giving small entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for just big business. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash gold. Today's podcast is also sponsored by the Traders Summit. I'll be participating in their live online conference next week from October 21st to the 23rd. So make sure and register for free at www.tsevent.net. The big news in the market today, as far as I'm concerned, maybe everybody else wasn't talking about this, but it is extremely significant. And that is the new highs across the board in interest rates all the way throughout the yield curve. At every maturity, it's a new high. We almost have a 4% handle on even a three-month T-bill, which settled at 3.96%. But the six-month Treasury bill is 4.44. The one year is 458 That is right now the high point of the curve. The two-year is 4.56. Five-year is 4.36. The 10-year is at 4.13. And the 30-year is at 4.12, almost identical. And in fact, during the day today and yesterday, the yields on the 30-year Treasury were higher than the yield on the 10-year Treasury. Now, that's normal for that to be the case, but we had been inverted for a while, and now that inversion has flattened out. But I believe we're going to start to see a more significant rise in the 30-year rate above the 10-year rate. And that's going to be very significant because what it's going to show is that bond investors are slowly waking up to the reality that high inflation is here to stay, that we're not going back to 2%. We're actually not even going to get close to 2%. I'm not sure how much investors realize that. But I think they're starting to realize that we're not going back down to 2%, that we're in for a much higher inflationary environment than what investors have gotten used to over the previous decade or so. And so that's beginning to be priced in to the bond market. And in fact, the yield on a 30-year U.S. Treasury at 4.12% is now higher than the yield on a 30-year U.K. gilt, which is now back below 4%. They were close to 5% before the Bank of England caved and started buying gilts to bring down the price. Although today, and I think one of the reasons that we got the sell-off in the bond market today, and there are many reasons, and of course, it's a bear market, so we don't even need a reason. The trend is lower in price and higher in yield was because the Bank of England did indicate that they were going to restart their quantitative tightening program. And so that was negative news. But despite that, yields on British bonds fell. And maybe because that means that the bond investors like the fact that that means that the Bank of England is getting back to inflation fighting and not just debt monetization. But we'll see if the Bank of England can actually follow through with that commitment. But I think it is significant that yields now on a U.S. 30-year Treasury are higher than on a 30-year British gilt, because that means that investors are more worried about inflation in the U.S. than they are about inflation in the U.K., because they're demanding a higher rate of interest to hold a dollar bond for 30 years than they are to hold a British pound bond for 30 years. And that's despite the current weakness in the British pound relative to the dollar This could be an indication, again, that the dollar is topping out. Now, the dollar was up a lot today on the backup in interest rates, but the dollar index did not make a new high. It's still close to 2% below its high. The dollar index almost got to 115, and today we're just below 113. Strong dollar, but the dollar didn't make a new high. The same story with gold. Again, gold reacted to the backup in interest rates by falling. Gold fell about $20 an ounce. It closed around $16.30, but it didn't make a new low. 
Gold stocks also got beat up on the day, but they didn't make new lows either. Now, the overall stock market kind of shrugged off what was happening in the bond market. Stocks did go down, but the Dow Jones finished down less than 100 points, down 99. The Nasdaq Composite was a bit weaker, only down about a half a percent. It was only the highly speculative stocks that really felt the sting of rising rates. The Kathy Wood ARK Innovation ETF was down over 4% on the day. But one of the factors that needs to be considered is that when you get a big drop in the bond market and you don't get a big drop in the stock market, that is very negative for the bond market. Because the one thing that might stop bonds from falling would be a big crash in the stock market that would drive people out of stocks into bonds both because they're looking for some type of relative safety, and so they're taking refuge in bonds, but also if we get a big move down in the stock market, that causes investors to become concerned about how that will impact the economy, how economic growth might be weaker due to a reverse wealth effect. That might benefit bonds. Also, if you do get a big drop in the stock market, maybe the Federal Reserve will be forced to pivot just to save the stock market, which is what the Fed has always done. Every time the stock market has gone down, the Fed has been there to bail it out. And so if we get a big drop in the stock market, then maybe investors will be betting on a bailout. And so they want to go ahead and buy bonds to front run that. But one of the realities that a lot of people don't want to accept is that right now that Fed put is not officially there. It's expired. And so you can't count on the Federal Reserve to bail you out. Now, I think eventually the Fed will. The question is, where is the strike price of that put? The Fed is willing to tolerate a bigger decline in the stock market than it has been willing to tolerate in the past. But there is a breaking point where the Fed is going to come in. The markets are going to have to test the waters to see how deep that breaking point is. But I was listening to somebody on CNBC, forget what her name was. She was a portfolio manager for somebody. But she was trying to talk about how investors were overreacting to what's happening in the markets, to inflation, to interest rates. Because in her opinion, the risks are not nearly as great today as they were, let's say, in the 2008 financial crisis or in 2020 with the COVID lockdowns. And I think she's wrong. I think there is more risk in the market now than during either of those events. And that's because the Fed was there to catch the markets because official inflation was still low enough that the Fed was there with QE, that the Fed was there with rate cuts to backstop the markets and limit your downside. The Fed is not there. It's like you're up on a high wire and there's no net. The market today is considerably more risky than it was in 2008 or in 2020. And it's amazing that people don't perceive that degree of risk. I talked about where the bond yields are on the 10-year. The last time the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury was this high, it was in June of 2008. And that was the peak of that cycle. And it started to come down. But what happened in 2008? The financial crisis. In fact, the big part of the financial crisis, what really kicked it into a high gear was the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And that happened in September of 2008. So three months after you hit that peak in the yield on the 10-year, which was almost exactly where we are right now, we're barely lower than that number. In fact, we'll probably take out that number before the end of this week and we'll be higher than we were in 2008. But that increase in interest rates was enough to cause a financial crisis. It caused the failure of Lehman Brothers and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Why did these entities fail? It was because of debt, specifically mortgage debt. But what happened? Interest rates went up and Asset prices, real estate prices came down. And so borrowers defaulted on their loans. They couldn't afford to pay the higher rates of interest. Remember, a lot of people had adjustable rate mortgages back then, which had gone up. But 
the real estate values had gone down. And so there were defaults and that kicked off all sorts of problems because there were all sorts of investments that were priced off of these defaults, leveraged investments with lots of counterparties and everything blew up and we had this financial crisis. But we have the same toxic situation today, only it's much worse than anything that was experienced in 2008. We have much more debt now than we had in 2008. We have much more debt now than we had in 2020, yet the Fed is not able to bail anybody out. But the point is, if the amount of debt we had in 2008 caused a financial crisis when interest rates went up, what type of financial crisis is the Fed going to create this time by raising interest rates when we have a lot more debt now? We have $31 trillion just in the national debt. It was about $9 trillion in 2008. So we've more than tripled the size of the national debt. And by the way, I was just reading that the government right now, despite these record $2 trillion or so budget deficits, now they're not quite as big as they were during the depths of the COVID lockdowns, but absent COVID, these are the highest deficits we've ever seen. The government is taxing Americans at the highest rate relative to GDP almost in history. We're at 19.6% right now. That's up from 17.9% in fiscal 2021. But the all-time record high for taxes as a percentage of GDP was just under 20%. And that was a level that we reached twice in our history. The first time was during the Second World War. In 1945, the federal government collected about 19.8% of GDP and taxes. And of course, the government needed all that tax revenue because we were fighting the Nazis, we were fighting Imperial Japan. And so it was extraordinary circumstances that brought that about. But the next time that happened, believe it or not, was in 2000, where the federal government collected just under 19.8% of taxes and GDP. And the reason for that was the government was flush with capital gains tax revenue because of the dot-com bubble. You had a lot of people cashing out, making a lot of money during that bubble, and that benefited the U.S. government. And that's what helped drive those Clinton surpluses during those years leading up to the bursting of the dot-com bubble. One of the reasons for those surpluses, and again, they were accounting gimmicks, they weren't real surpluses, but the government had a lot of revenue because of that dot-com bubble. And as soon as that bubble popped, those surpluses disappeared, and we started producing large deficits under Bush. But right now, we're almost up to that level, almost at the highs reached during the 2000 stock market bubble and during World War II, except we have these enormous deficits. The deficits are much larger now than they were in 2000. In fact, as I said, on paper, at least the government was showing a surplus. Even though we have record tax collection, We're running these enormous deficits. What does that tell you? Even though we're being taxed at a record high level, we're not being taxed enough to cover the massive amount of government spending. Right now, all that government spending is being financed by inflation because we're running massive budget deficits. And so the tax we're paying is higher prices, but we should be paying higher taxes. But what these numbers tell you is that higher tax rates are coming, especially since the U.S. government is going to have to spend a lot more money because of inflation, because inflation is driving up a lot of the government spending programs like Social Security, mentioned that on the last podcast, like this big backup in interest rates. As I said, yields are now up to 4%. They moved up from 3% to 4% on the 10-year, 30-year U.S. Treasury. That took less than three months to have that move. I think the move from 4% to 5% could happen even quicker. And then the move from 5% to 6% could be even quicker than that. Think about the impact that those interest rates are going to have. What's 5% of a $31 trillion national debt? That's more than $1.5 trillion. That's an expense that has to be paid every single year. And it's going to go up, not only as interest rates go up, but the national debt itself keeps going up. And to put this in perspective, to think about how much damage 
to this economy, this backup in interest rates is going to cause, you really need to look back and see just how low interest rates were and how long they were kept that low. And again, my criticism of the Fed isn't that they're raising rates. The problem isn't the rates going up. The rates going up are just exposing the problem. The problem was created by keeping rates so low and keeping them there so long. That was the problem. We have to let interest rates go up and then deal with the consequences of the problem. I'm just betting that when the consequences of that problem are great enough, the Fed is going to reverse course. The Fed is going to pivot. The only question is, will the Fed pivot to avoid a financial crisis or will it pivot in the aftermath of a financial crisis? But either way, it's going to pivot because it's not going to allow that financial crisis to just run its course because then it would be unthinkable politically to watch the massive losses and the bankruptcies and the failures and really a depression just play out and the Fed just sideline because it was going to fight inflation because all of these bad things are not going to cure inflation. Inflation is actually going to get worse as the economy implodes, because that imploding economy is going to prick the dollar bubble if it hadn't already pricked in the anticipation of that implosion, because the markets are going to figure out that the Fed is ultimately going to try to bail out the markets and bail out the government by creating even more inflation, except they're not going to do it in an environment where inflation is below 2%, and they can pretend that a little more inflation is healthy and needed they're going to be in an environment where inflation is way above 2%. And the last thing the markets want will be more inflation. But that's going to be the only thing the Fed can provide. Because again, inflation has been the way the Fed has gotten us out of every problem in the past. But now we're in a problem that was caused by all that inflation. That was the inevitable consequence of all these mistakes. And so now we're having to deal with the consequences of postponing the pain of every crisis by creating inflation. Now inflation has become the crisis and the government has no solution because the only solution the government has to any crisis or any problem is to create inflation. But when inflation becomes the problem, it's out of solutions. Not that it ever had a solution. Its solution was kicking the can down the road. The only problem is now that can can't be kicked. Either there's no more road or it's just too heavy. Can we talk about notifications for a second? Who actually leaves those sounds on anymore? Well, besides that kind, that's the sound of another sale happening on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify has all the sales channels already sorted so your business keeps on growing from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even across social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere. Whether your thing is vintage teas or recipes for ghee, start selling with Shopify and join the platform that's simplifying commerce for millions of your favorite businesses worldwide. With Shopify, you'll create an online store in your vibe, discover new customers, and grow the following that keeps them coming back. And thanks to 24-7 support and free libraries full of educational content, Shopify's got you every step of the way. It's how every minute new sellers around the world make their first sale with Shopify, and you will too. When you're ready to launch your thing into the spotlight, do it with Shopify. The commerce platform already backing millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. These are the possibilities, and they're powered by Shopify. Shopify makes selling so simple that just about anyone can do it. Making your ideas real opens endless possibilities, and I love how Shopify makes it so easy for anyone to successfully run their own business. It's never been easier to start and grow a business thanks to Shopify. Try Shopify for free and start selling anywhere. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash gold. Go to shopify.com slash gold to start selling online today. That's shopify.com slash gold. But to really appreciate the severity of this problem, you have to go back and look at how abnormally low the Fed kept interest rates and for how long it kept them so low. Remember, despite all the rate hikes that we've had thus far, the Fed fund rate right now is three and one eighth. That's the midpoint 
the Fed's target is for Fed funds rate between three and three and a quarter. So that's three and an eighth. That is still a very low Fed funds rate, especially when you consider that inflation is eight and a quarter. So you're still talking about very high negative interest rates, which are inflationary. I've already talked about that. The rates are so low right now, they're encouraging spending, they're encouraging debt. The opposite of what you would want to do if you were fighting inflation, you would want to punish people for going into debt to consume. You would want to reward people for saving and under-consuming, and you don't reward people by punishing them with a negative real rate of interest. You have to reward them with a positive real rate of interest, and we're not even close to doing that. But you have to keep this in perspective to where rates have been historically. Everybody forgets what's normal. People think that the low interest rates that we had in the last decade are normal. They're not. They were abnormal. I went back to the 1960s and I decided to look at each decade and average the federal funds rates for the entirety of that decade. And so that would smooth out some of the higher rates and some of the lower rates to just get an average. So during the 1960s, the Fed funds rate averaged 4.2%. So we're still about a full percentage point lower than that right now. During the 1970s, that decade, the average Fed funds rate was 7.1%. So that's more than double the current Fed funds rate. In the 1980s, the average for the federal funds rate was 10%. So that's more than triple the current federal funds rate. That was the average. Obviously, there were some years that were higher than that in the early 1980s. In fact, I think the high point was 22% for the Fed funds rate. It got that high. But for the entire decade, it averaged 10%. But the 1990s, that wasn't that long ago, the average Fed funds rate in the 1990s was 5.15%. That's still significantly higher than the 3.15% or so that we're at today during the 2000s, even with the big drop in the Fed funds rate following the 2008 financial crisis, where short-term rates went to 1%. If you look at the entirety of that decade, the average Fed funds rate was 4.14%. That's still about a full percentage point above where we are right now. But the problem is we have a lot more inflation now than we had back then. We had a lot more debt now than we had back then. We should have a much higher Fed funds rate now than we had back then. And one of the things I hear all the time from people when I talk about how high interest rates have to go, they say that can never happen because we have so much debt right now. We can't afford to pay these high interest rates. And so the government has to keep them low because we can't afford to pay. But you don't get some kind of get out of debt jail free card because you have a lot of debt. You don't get rewarded with a low interest rate because you can't afford to pay a high interest rate. If it was that simple, then everybody would just borrow a lot of money so that they can get a lower interest rate. No, it's actually the opposite. If you have more debt, you're a worse credit risk. And so you have to pay a higher rate of interest. It's not the more debt you have, the lower the interest rate. It's the more debt you have, the higher the interest rate. That's why when you get your credit scores and everybody wants to look at how much money you owe, if you owe a lot of money, that lowers your credit score. And therefore, you have to pay more money to borrow because there's a higher risk of default. Well, there is a higher risk of default in treasuries too. It's just not necessarily an honest default. It could be an inflation default because when lenders are loaning money to a sovereign government that is borrowing in its own currency, there are two things they look at. They look at, will the government default because it has too much debt relative to the ability of the taxpayers to pay that debt? Or because it has so much debt, and it doesn't have the ability to raise taxes, will it print a lot of money? And if it's going to print money to pay its debt, well, then inflation is going to erode away the value of the money that lenders are paid in. And so that has to be built into the interest rate. The interest rate has to take into consideration not only the risk of a outright default, but the risk of inflation. And there is a greater risk of inflation the more debt a government has. The more debt it has, the less likely it is to pay it off honestly. 
and the more likely it's going to resort to paying it off with inflation. And so the fact that we have so much more debt now, that doesn't mean that we should have lower interest rates because we have so much debt. We should have higher interest rates. And yes, that is a huge problem. Having a lot of debt and having to pay high interest rates on that debt is a big problem. That's the type of thing that blew up in Greece. Other countries have experienced this. The only reason that America hasn't experienced this yet is because of the special status the U.S. dollar has as the reserve currency, as the safe haven. If America was any other nation experiencing these problems, we would have already had a crisis. But because we haven't been disciplined by the markets, we've had all this extra room, we've been able to dig ourselves into an even deeper hole, and so we have an even bigger problem. Eventually, the markets are going to rein this in. Now, getting back to the level of Fed funds, during the 2010s, the Fed funds rate averaged 0.43%. That's the entire decade. The Fed funds rate was less than a half a percent. And of course, for most of that decade, it was barely above zero. It was about one eighth of a percent because the official Fed funds rate was between zero and 25 basis points. They didn't even start really raising interest rates until Donald Trump got elected president. And they tried to raise rates and they didn't get very far before they had to cut them back down again in 2020. But you had an entire decade where the federal funds rate was basically zero, 0.43, compared to any other decade. The next lowest was the 2000s at 4.14. That's basically 10 times as high. But every other decade, rates were much higher because they were that low and they stayed that low for so long. An entire phony economy developed that was built on the foundation of near free money. And if so much damage got done during the real estate bubble, because the Fed brought interest rates to 1% and left them there for about a year and a half, and then slowly moved them back up to 4 or 5%, and we had the 2008 financial crisis, just imagine the severity of the malinvestments, of the misallocations of resources, of the monumental mistakes that have been made throughout this economy by the government, by the private sector, corporations, individuals, everybody has made mistakes because of this cheap money. Remember, one of the things that George Bush pointed out after the 2008 financial crisis was that Wall Street got drunk. And he was correct. Wall Street was drunk. But I pointed out that the analogy finished too soon because what Bush always left out was who was the bartender? Why was everybody on Wall Street drunk? Where did they get the alcohol? Who liquored them up? That was the Federal Reserve. That was Alan Greenspan. He was the bartender. He kept serving the drinks. That's why Wall Street was drunk. Main Street was drunk too. The whole nation was drunk on cheap money. And while they were drunk, they did a lot of stupid things, just like a lot of people do when they're drunk. They do stupid things. They don't realize how dumb they were until the following morning when they wake up and maybe they see photographs of some of the crazy things that they did where they were drunk. Or people tell them about the crazy things they did when they were drunk. And then it's like, oh my God, how could I have been so stupid? Well, you were drunk. Well, think about how much more drunk everybody is now because the alcohol has been pouring for over an entire decade. So we have an economy where far more drunken mistakes have been made than the ones that were made that led to the 2008 financial crisis. And so when we sober up, all of those mistakes are finally going to be laid bare. It's like when Warren Buffett talks about when the tide goes out, we see who's swimming naked. Basically, this pool has been so deep for so long, nobody has got a swimsuit on. Everybody has been naked and everybody is going to be exposed when the tide goes out, which is what's happening right now. And that's why it's only a matter of time. And I don't think there's much more time left if you look at the rapidity with which interest rates are normalizing. And again, they're not just going back to normal. They're going to a high level. Pendulums don't swing from one extreme and then stop in the middle. They go from one extreme to the other extreme. So we're going from very low interest rates to very high interest rates at a time where we have massive amounts of debt. Those two things cannot coexist without massive defaults 
on debt. And when that happens, you have a financial crisis. And I don't think the Federal Reserve could sit back and watch that happen and claim, hey, we're fighting inflation. We don't care about any of this. I believe the Fed's commitment to fighting inflation ends when that fight leads to a financial crisis or a significant decline in the economy or increase in unemployment. As long as the Fed can pretend that everything is okay and the economy is strong, well, it's willing to pretend that it's committed to fighting inflation. But it will give that up the minute it is presented with an even bigger problem. Now, in my opinion, inflation is the biggest problem, but in the short run, it will be trumped by an even bigger problem, which is going to be financial crisis, recession, slash depression. The government will always choose inflation over that because inflation happens later. The damage happens later. As we can see, right now we're experiencing the inflation that the Fed created a decade ago. So the consequences were postponed. But the consequences from a financial crisis are immediate. And also, the voters know who to blame. If everything starts crashing and the government does nothing, well, the voters blame the government. The voters will blame the central bank. But if the central bank saves the economy by creating inflation, printing money, cutting interest rates, if the government comes in with all kinds of spending programs, and then we end up with higher consumer prices, People don't necessarily blame that on the politicians. They don't blame that on the central banks. In fact, the politicians blame it on everybody but themselves. They blame it on Putin, which is what they're still doing. In fact, Biden gave a press conference today where he talked about the high oil prices and he began his press conference by blaming everything on Putin. Except the problem is, even though oil prices were up about $3 a barrel today and they finished just below $86 a barrel, we're actually down about 8% from where we were the day before Putin invaded the Ukraine. So if oil prices are lower now than they were when Putin invaded the Ukraine, how could the high oil prices we have now be Putin's fault? They can't be. What Biden doesn't want to acknowledge is that oil prices have risen 70% since he became president, despite the fact that they've fallen by 8% since Putin invaded the Ukraine. Now, also, prices would be higher, yes, if it wasn't for his raid on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is actually going to be picked up. They're going to be selling even more oil, which I think plays right in uh, to what Russia wants or what OPEC wants, because we're going to deplete our Strategic Petroleum Reserves And then OPEC is going to have a field day because they're going to be able to really jack up prices and it's going to be very difficult for us to do anything about it because we're going to have no more strategic petroleum reserves. Now, also what was interesting about the press conference today, Joe Biden was demanding that oil companies not use their extra income that they're having now with higher oil prices to reward their shareholders. Don't buy back your stock. Don't pay dividends. Joe Biden wants those oil companies to use that money to reinvest in more production. Well, you know what? It's not up to the president of the United States to tell those oil companies what to do with their profits. The oil companies need to decide for themselves what the best use is for their profits. Maybe the best use is to reward the shareholders who own these companies and who are entitled to the benefits when times are good. After all, when times were bad and these companies were slashing their dividends, they suffered, people who own these companies. If you can't get rewarded when times are good, then why even own an oil company? If the minute the profits go up, the government is saying, hey, don't reward your shareholders by sharing those profits, why should anybody invest in these companies? How are you going to attract capital as an industry if the president of the United States tries to prevent you from rewarding the investors that put their capital at risk when times get good. That is completely un-American, anti-capitalism for Joe Biden to use the bully pulpit of the presidency to try to shame oil companies into not rewarding their shareholders when oil prices are higher. Now, there's no legislation behind that, but what I would be afraid is this is a precursor to maybe some higher taxes, windfall profit taxes, or to punish buybacks or to punish dividends. You never hear presidents talking about tech companies and say, hey, these tech companies, they shouldn't be using their profits 
to buy back stocks. No, nobody is upset when a tech company buys back stock, but an oil company, it can't buy back stock. Look, the oil companies need to decide, does it make sense to invest money in more exploration and development? Now, one reason it might not make sense is if you have a president like Biden threatening to tax their profits or threatening to tell them not to share their profits with shareholders, that actually discourages you from investing in future production. But another thing that Joe Biden is doing right now to discourage oil companies from investing is by dumping out the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because the president is artificially depressing the price of oil temporarily by selling from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. If you want oil companies to invest more, the best way to do that is to let prices go up even higher because it's the higher prices that act as an inducement for the oil companies to invest in greater future production. But Biden is trying to minimize the rise in oil prices, but then trying to encourage oil companies to go out and risk more money to drill more oil. Those are mutually exclusive. And by the way, what Biden needs to be doing, if he wants oil companies to take the risk of investing money now, he needs to do something to reduce the regulation and taxation experienced by that industry so that it is more likely that those investments bear fruit because the risk these oil companies take is let's say they take a lot of money now when the price of oil is high and they make some investments to bring on stream future production. What happens if by the time that future production comes on stream, oil prices have gone down and they're losing money? That is a risk that they may not want to take. And what are the risks associated with those investments are regulation and taxes. And so instead of just beating up the executives and trying to order them to make more investments, why don't you change the law? Why don't you repeal some of the regulations and lower some of the taxes inside the industry so that you actually remove some of the disincentives to make that investment and stop beating up on them? Stop threatening to take away their profits the minute they start making them. Because oil companies will only make investments if they believe those investments are going to result in future profits. Profits is what motivates the investment. People invest in oil companies so that they can make money selling oil. If you try to shame them out of that, if you try to vilify these companies for profiting when oil prices go up, you make it harder for the industry to attract capital. But the point I was actually trying to make before I veered off on this tangent was I was using this as an example of how politicians will blame others for inflation. Like Biden is able to blame inflation on Putin. He's even able to blame high gas prices on Putin when oil prices have gone down since Putin invaded the Ukraine. So if the Federal Reserve creates a lot of inflation to bail out the economy, to bail out investors, to bail out the U.S. government, and then prices end up going up, they don't have to accept responsibility for those higher prices. They could blame speculators. They could blame OPEC. They can blame Putin. They can blame greedy businesses gouging the consumers. The politicians love to blame the rich businessmen who are profiteering and who are gouging, and they'll also start blaming speculators. You'll start to see commodity prices going up or oil prices going up, and some people will be getting rich off of that because they're speculating and they're getting rewarded for being right, and the politicians will vilify the speculators. Like there's always somebody to blame for inflation. There's nobody to blame. If you sit back and allow everything to collapse and you don't do anything about it, you don't have a government program to bail everything out, you don't have a stimulus program, well, then the voters blame the people in power. They blame the politicians. So if the politicians can do something about the crisis and then the result is that we have big increases in consumer prices, the public is not going to make the connection between the government spending programs and the Fed money printing and prices going up. And the media and Wall Street and everybody else is going to help make sure that they don't make that connection by not calling out the government or the Federal Reserve. They will play into this by excusing the government, the Federal Reserve. In fact, Wall Street, they're the ones that pound the table. They want bailouts. They want stimulus. They want government involvement. And so they don't criticize the Federal Reserve and the government when they're pursuing these inflationary policies. And so they don't want to be honest with the public about the true sources of inflation. Of course, the government 
doesn't want to be honest. The media is never honest. And in many cases, they don't even understand where inflation is coming from. So it's not necessarily that they're being dishonest. They're just being ignorant. But all of this is why when push comes to shove, the Federal Reserve is going to choose higher inflation and it's going to do everything it can to bail out the economy and bail out the government from a financial crisis and deflation because the politics are simple. You allow a financial crisis and deflation, you get blamed immediately. If you decide to intervene and accept the trade-off of higher inflation, you don't get blamed because it's not immediate and you have the ability to point the finger at somebody else. I want to invite all of my listeners to join me on the Traders Summit live online conference next week from October 21st to the 23rd, sponsored by the brokerage firm 8Cap. This will be the fourth time I've had the pleasure of participating in this free event that's all about the economy and the financial markets. On this occasion, I'm going to be debating monetary policy with Danny Blanchflower, who formerly worked for the Bank of England. The Bank of England has made a lot of monetary policy mistakes over the years, and they've been in the news a lot recently, so this should be a particularly lively debate. The event speaker lineup is once again world-class. Other than myself, you've got Danielle DiMartino Booth, Daniel LaCalle, Mark Minaviti, Jim Bianco, Michelle Schneider, Tracy Schuchert, and many more. Registrants will also be automatically entered into a raffle with two iPhone 14s up for grabs thanks to a generous sponsor sponsorship from 8cap. So go to www.tsevent.net to register for free. tsevent, all one word, .net. Register now and I'll see you there. But I want to go back and talk about what happened in the stock market. I mentioned earlier in the podcast that the Dow was down just under 100 points today. In fact, this was the first down day of the week. We had a strong market on both Monday and Tuesday. And again, when I recorded my last podcast, On Saturday, I talked about once again, we had a big drop in the market on Friday. And so the specter of a Black Monday was hanging over the weekend. And once again, not only did we not get a big drop on Monday, we got a big rise. And that has been the pattern. We keep getting very weak closes on Fridays, and then we get big rallies the following Monday. And what I think is happening and has been happening is early in the week, you get a lot of rallies based on hope. We don't have a crash coming in Monday morning. We get some buying, maybe we get some short covering, and then some suckers get enticed into the market because they think maybe the bottom is in, and so they want to move in, and then we get this rally. But then what happens is when there is a rally, investors take advantage of that bear market rally to sell, to unload more stocks, and then we get a big sell-off at the end of the week. And what we haven't got yet in the markets is that capitulation. We keep having all this hope that a bottom is in. And as long as people are hoping that the bottom is in, we're not going to have a bottom. We need to have people throwing in the towel and giving up hope. That's when you can get some type of bottom. Now, I still think we're a long ways away from a real bottom, certainly adjusted for inflation or priced in gold, but we could get a nominal bottom in U.S. dollars based on there being significant inflation ahead. But so far, despite the pessimism that's out there, I think there's still a high degree of complacency among investors, and people just fail to accept how much of the current valuation is based on artificially low interest rates That no longer exists. And rates are still lower than they should be. They still have a long way to rise based on some of the examples I already gave on the historic averages for the Fed funds and where we are right now. We're still well below the historic average where we should be well above it, given that we have a lot more debt than we have had historically. And so we should be paying a much higher rate of interest on that debt because we are less credit worthy. Either there's a greater probability of default or more likely of inflation. And since inflation is already high, the likelihood that it gets even higher is even greater. And so there should be a bigger inflation premium built into interest rates than the premiums that were built in in the past. But despite these facts, investors are still oblivious to how much room the market still has to fall 
given how high valuations still are and how low interest rates still are and how much further they have to rise. Now, during the day, one of the big up movers was Netflix, which reported better than expected earnings. The stock rose 13% today. That's a big day, but you have to keep today's rally in perspective because the stock is still down 60% from its high. So it's very likely that this rally is an opportunity to sell, not an opportunity to buy. In fact, there's already been a huge rally off the lows. Yes, the stock is 60% off its high, but it's 70% above its low. So we've already had a huge rally in Netflix. But as far as I'm concerned, the rally has likely run its course. There is still a lot of downside for Netflix. It is a very expensive stock and it faces very stiff competition. And remember, nobody needs to subscribe to Netflix. If you can afford it, you'll subscribe. If you can't, you'll use your friend's account or you'll subscribe temporarily just so you can binge watch a few programs and then you'll let your subscription lapse so that you can use something else. So Netflix is in a very tough position right now, and it's not the type of stock that you would want to own in an inflationary rising interest rate environment. And even if the Fed stops raising interest rates, inflation is going to keep going up, and inflation is the enemy of growth stocks. But more important than the earnings numbers that came out today We've got some important earnings that came out after the bell. First of all, IBM reported, and that actually beat on profits, and the stock is trading higher. But what I want to talk about are two companies in particular. One is Tesla, because I talked about the big drop in Tesla, stock down about 50% from its highs, and now we got the earnings coming out. And though Tesla beat a little bit, on profits, it missed on revenue. And when you have a stock as expensive as Tesla, you can't miss on anything. So I think this is bad news, even though the profits were better than expected, they need a bigger beat. And in fact, Tesla is trading down after hours. It's down about 5% on the day now. It's still not at a new 52-week low, But it's pretty close. And I think the stock has a long way to fall. And this is part of the bubble popping. Tesla was one of the darlings of the meme type stocks. It was a meme stock before they even coined the term meme stock because it basically traded off the popularity of Elon Musk and shareholders behaved more like cult members than investors. But anything that is bid up on hype is prone to collapse. And that is part of the risk in this market. There are so many stocks that have been priced on hope. And the risk is that reality sets in and these stocks are all repriced to reflect reality. And when reality has to rear its head and has to be priced into many of these hyped up stocks, the prices are going to collapse and the investors are never going to get their money back because the prices are never going to go back up to those insane levels once the insanity is gone and investors are using logic instead of emotion to buy stocks. That's the reason that the stocks that we're buying for our clients and the ones that we have been buying, we're buying value. We're buying companies that you can value based on their earnings, based on their dividends. And we're making sure that we are getting a good price, that we're not overpaying for the stocks that we're buying. That's what ultimately diminishes the risk in investing in stocks. That doesn't mean that value stocks can't go down in price, but it does mean that if they do go down in price, they're likely to come back up in price. Because if you bought a stock that was cheap and it got cheaper, okay, that doesn't mean it's going to stay cheaper. Eventually, it's going to come back to fair value or maybe above fair value. And in the meantime, while you're waiting for a stock that you bought cheap that got cheaper, to go back up, you can collect dividends. And at the end of the day, those dividends are more meaningful than the change in the price of the stock. Because if a stock that you buy goes down, but you don't sell it, the lower price doesn't mean anything. All the lower price means is that if you had to sell it, you would have got a lower price, but you didn't sell it, but you didn't sell it, so it doesn't matter. But you did collect the dividend. And at the end of the day, it's the dividends that count. And the more dividends that you collect, the more you earn. 
The problem with all of these momentum stocks is they didn't pay any dividends. So once the price crashes, you have nothing left to show for the fact that you owned it for all those years. If you didn't take profits, the rally meant nothing. Just like if you don't sell when a stock goes down, the paper loss doesn't count. Well, if you don't sell when a stock goes up, the paper gain doesn't count either. The gain doesn't count until you realize it. The same thing with the loss. What counts is the dividends that you collect between the time you buy it and the time you sell it. Now, if you don't collect any dividends because the stock doesn't pay any dividends, the only way you're going to make money is if you sell it for a higher price than you bought it. And most people won't do that. Maybe on paper, they'll watch the stock go up, but they won't sell. When they'll sell is when it crashes and it's down and either they need the money or they panic and they get out. But if you buy a good dividend paying stock, even if you sell the stock at a price that's lower than what you paid, if you ended up collecting enough dividends along the way, you actually still end up with a good return on the investment, even if you sell it for less than you paid because of all the dividends that you collected while you owned the stock. So I think if more air comes out of the Tesla bubble tomorrow, we could get an even broader sell off in a lot of these high flying stocks. And again, As we get into Thursday and Friday, that's when we can continue the pattern of investors throwing in the towel and giving up hope later in the week. And maybe we'll get another very weak Friday to close off the week, whether or not it's followed up by another Monday rally or we eventually get a big crash on Monday. We'll see. But so far, the pattern is rally early in the week and then sell off later in the week, which in my mind is a very bearish technical pattern. But what I want to talk about is not the earnings that were announced by Tesla, but the pre-announcement after the bell by Allstate, because Allstate shares are down about 10% in after hours trading. But what's really significant about the Allstate announcement is that it highlights something that I've been talking about with respect to insurance. And that is that insurance rates are going way up because insurance companies need more money. They need to charge higher premiums to cover their operating expenses. And that's the reason that Allstate is warning. They're talking about all the claims they're paying out. And of course, now they're going to have big claims in Florida because of the hurricane. And they just didn't collect enough in premiums. They're not charging high enough premiums. I mentioned on my last podcast that I got a 40% increase in my own homeowner's policy due to the higher cost to replace my house if it burns down or something. Well, the same thing is going to be happening all over the country. Insurance rates are going way up. Insurance companies are losing money. Their investment portfolios are going down. They're getting clobbered on stocks. They're getting clobbered on bonds. And they have rising costs. And so they have to raise premiums. And that is going to be reflected in the CPI. That's going to hit consumers. That's going to continue to push up the cost of home ownership. Again, you have a lot of people pointing to the fact that real estate prices are now starting to fall and they think, hey, the Fed is wrong. Shelter costs are coming down because real estate prices are coming down. No, shelter costs are still going up. Even if it's cheaper to buy a home, what's important is how much it costs to own the home. And those costs are going up because even if you pay less, you're still going to end up paying more in your mortgage Mortgage rates are now above 7% for a 30-year fix. I think they're at 7.1. So even if the house costs a little less, the mortgage payment is still higher because you're paying a much higher interest rate. Even if you're borrowing less, the cost to finance that debt is higher. But not only is it the mortgage payment that's driving up the cost of home ownership, it's higher insurance, higher property taxes higher maintenance, all of this is increasing the cost of owning homes. And it makes it more likely that some of the people who borrowed money to buy homes aren't going to pay and they're going to go into default. But you know, what's going to happen with a lot of the people who strategically decide to stop making their mortgage payments is they're going to do it because they know that they're not going to have to move out of their house right away. Because when you stop making your mortgage payments, you could live in that house two, three, or four years before the bank could kick you out. And during that period of time, you don't have to make any mortgage payments. You don't even have to pay your property taxes because the local government is not likely to foreclose on you because you didn't pay your property taxes. 
they'll wait for the bank to foreclose and sell the property because then the local government gets to back property taxes right off the top. It's the lender that gets stuck with the loss because the property taxes get paid first. The mortgage lender just gets what's left over. And of course, what also happens when these homes go into foreclosure, where the people who own them have lived there for many years without making mortgage payments, they also don't make repairs. Why should they spend money fixing up a house that they don't even own? Whatever money they spend is just helping out the bank. They're not benefiting. And in fact, what they often do before they leave the house is they gut the place. They start selling everything. They sell the appliances. They'll sell all sorts of fixtures that are part of the house. They may have been part of the house when they bought it, but since they own the house, they think they have a right to sell whatever parts of the house they want to and then just kind of leave the lender with a shell of a house because a lot of the value has been stripped out and sold by the borrower. And so when the lender gets their collateral back, it doesn't have a lot of value, especially if you have years of unpaid property taxes. So all of this has the making of a massive crisis. One of the main reasons that some people may choose to stay in their homes is because they have such low mortgage rates. If you've got a 30-year fixed rate loan and you're locked in in the low threes, and now you have mortgage rates in the sevens going to the eights or the nines, a lot of people aren't going to sell because they can't afford to buy something else because if they buy another property, they're not going to be able to get those low mortgage rates anymore. They're going to have to get a high rate. You can't transfer your mortgage from your current home to a new home, nor can the buyer of your home assume your mortgage. They have to take out a brand new mortgage. And so because so many people have such low mortgage rates, they're going to hold off and they're going to stay in their houses as long as they can, which is a problem for the lender because now they're stuck with a money losing mortgage because rates are moving up, but they're collecting these low interest rates on these mortgages. They're going to lose money on those. But then for the people who don't pay their mortgages because they're so underwater, the bank is going to lose again because now when the bank forecloses, the value is not going to be there because real estate prices are going to be more a reflection of the current high mortgage rates than the previous low mortgage rates, because anyone buying a house has to pay the high rate. And what determines the price of the house is what the buyer can pay, not what the seller once paid. Yes, the fact that a lot of people are going to hold on to their homes and not sell them will help reduce the supply of homes on the market. But ultimately, the price is going to be a function of what the buyer is able to pay. And the buyer is not able to pay very much when interest rates are high. The buyer can pay a lot more when interest rates are low because what you're buying are the monthly payments, not the price. All of this was a big problem leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. It's going to be an even bigger problem this time because rates were lower for longer. The real estate bubble is even bigger than the one we had back then, but it's combined with an overall bubble in the entire economy that dwarfs what we had in 2008. That's why this is a much bigger financial crisis that's around the corner. And again, that's why I don't believe the Fed is going to sit back and just watch this whole thing play out. It's going to hold off as long as it can to try to maintain as much credibility as it can. But the minute it senses that things are about to implode, then it's going to turn on a dime. But I believe the markets will come to this conclusion before the Fed and start to price in the pivot before the Fed actually pivots.